I guess when David and Sylvia asked me to join the panel, um, I, I spent the last sort of seven years running IDEO Asia. So the reason, mainly why I'm here is I've been running IDEO Asia from the office in Shanghai for the last six years. And earlier this year, I took the sort of even scary, stupid jump of leaving a very happy consulting kind of role to join a, an enormous global trading company which, uh, as I'm told, at any one moment has 80 billion bits of stuff in its supply chain. So pretty much, if the products that you're wearing, you sleep in, you live in, whatever, they're made either by someone that Li and Fung knows or something close to it. And so for me, there was this kind of like, it was an interesting sh shift from sort of this consulting world into a really big, scary place that was kind of like, I didn't really kind of understand. But the, the interesting thing for me was over the last six years, I have watched the innovation flow, I should say, from companies from the West to come into the China, from China going out and global. I've watched all of this happen and I've been sort of in the middle of it, either pushing one side and pushing the other, or pushing both sides sometimes. And what becomes really interesting is the East versus West conversation for me becomes kind of dull. It's not either or, but and. It's the only thing I've learned, or one of the things I've learned from being in China is it can't be about either or, it's always and, and whether that's east and west, or south and north, or big and small. It's the and, which I think is the thing that's gonna lead us forward. I have not figured out what the and is yet, but the idea that it's, it's somewhere to do with a sort of, and, and I think as I'm, as I'm watching the maker movement evolve as it's from where it started to where it is now, it's, it's in this really interesting place where it's sort of an open source knowledge economy, and I, I, I'm, I spent 20 years in the creative con economy as it is, and, and, and I, I think the, the piece of the puzzle that's still missing is how does anybody either monetize or doesn't monetize what the knowledge economy is? Because I think the, the notion of where the, whether it's changing mindsets and culture in China or whether it's changing mindsets and culture in the US or, or Europe, knowledge is the thing that will enable both of these, the, the and to happen, is where, is where I keep going. And so I think the conversation needs to get changed from is it either west or, 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 or east to a place where it's, it's about and. And that, that, those throw up for me a sense of opportunities and barriers. Because as I now sit in this company that kind of makes lots of stuff in China and lots of stuff in Ethiopia and Bangladesh and wherever we make stuff and then they sell it somewhere else, I, I'm convinced that the world has become, whether it's omni-channel retailing or omni-sourcing or all of these things, the world is becoming a very flat place. And, and again, so what that throws up is, is that all of the infrastructural things, education, finance, supply chain, supply chains, all of those things are all being broken up, being reformed and then recatalyzed in a completely different way so that the players of old are not going to be the players in the future. And so again, so what, what for me, is, I'm actually an anthropologist by trade. So my, my trade up for 30 years I've been watching people and whether they're consumers or whether they're employees. It's this interesting notion where these two things are kind of being balanced now. And so as I look at the maker movement, it's, a, it's one of those few times that actually it's a human network. That's the thing that makes this cool, is people like Mitch who are super passionate and that people here are also passionate. And that, that, those two things exist in both places. And so it becomes really interesting when you see that this is a small moment in time when the sort of more humanistic part of what we do, what we play, what we're passionate about, becomes the, the sort of small, many small things versus lots of big things. And I work for a really big thing that doesn't see itself as a big thing, it sees itself as lots of small things. And so I, I, I go to this place where I'm really intrigued about the, 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 the sort of change, the sh swapping of information, sharing I think is the thing that makes the whole thing move. And actually just sharing because you can, or sharing because you want to, or sharing because you're passionate, I think is something that I see Chinese people doing all the time, right? I mean, whether it's over coffee, whether it's over dinner, whatever it is, there's a sharing mentality that happens in China as it does in a cafe in Paris. And so somewhere along the line that there's this notion that if we can keep continue to share, then there'll be create some sort of general understanding around the why. Because innovation for me is just a process to get to a different place. Is it innovation, is it innovation, is it invention, I, I, as I said, I've, I've grown six years off having the same question of like, please describe what Chinese innovation is, and I, I'm kind of bored with the conversation. So, so I'm at that place where I, wa I want us to begin to understand what the, what the collaboration is, what the relationships are, 
because the, it's the bits that are in between us, not the things themselves or the things that will drive the future. And I think this is a perfect forum to start doing that. And I, I would love to see all the... I think the, the thing I'm really intrigued about how the maker movement works is how do you now connect some of that knowledge so, so it, 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 it forms not small things, but there's a collective bigger thing as well. Because that collective bigger thing will, at some point, break all the markets that are already there. Um, and that's why me, I guess, as a part of something of a big thing, I'm now really interested in how all of this played out. So I'm super interested in what all these guys are doing. In 2010, the, the Shanghai government announced um, to support um, the funding um, for 100 hackerspaces as so-called innovation houses in, in Shanghai. And many of you might have heard about this. Um, I'm curious to hear from all of you, what does it mean um, if the government supports a movement, like they make a movement that is usually thought of, as many of you articulated, as bottom-up, grassroots? So, so the only thing, because I have, I've sat on, in many government rooms and discussed the same thing, which is we have lots of these innovation spaces. And then the only thing I'll say is, is innovation for me is about climate control, not command and control. So it's about climate control, not command and control. So it's about creating the environments for things to happen. And it often starts at the opposite end of where it should do. So versus saying, we're gonna, we're gonna create a farm over here, you're gonna plant these seeds, we'll watch these seeds and they'll grow. Essentially you have to, I think this is what Eric was going, there are already seeds already out there. Let's figure out which ones to help. That's a much more nuanced game that takes a lot longer to do than we're gonna have 100 hacker spaces. And so ultimately, the, 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 the thing is, is, is it's, it's just mo much more nuanced than that, because if you look at the growth of the Silicon Valley, it didn't have any government help. I mean, most of the good spaces, actually, the point of the role of the government is to get out of the way, right? And so the question is, how does the government get out, get out of the way, but actually help? That's, that's the nuanced piece of it. And so I love the uh, super tactical ideas of, so we should, as a maker movement, th therefore, so okay, if you could have 10 really interesting ideas that would help the government, one of those is, let's take some of the internet cafes and actually enable them to be somewhere interesting spaces. Um, that, that would be one concrete idea. You could imagine you could ask the maker movement in China, give us 10 ideas, and then actually put those 10 ideas out there. Then it moves from theory, which is about do we have innovation spaces, to actually then doing something that I was learning as we go. It seems to be, for me, what makers are about. It's about strategy with your hands. Thank you. Um, building on, on these thoughts, um, so the Chinese government is, is not alone in supporting the make movement. Um, you know, we've seen this with governments elsewhere, um, particularly also the US, but also you know, prominent figures in the media and cultures industry, like Chris Anderson, for example, um, have argued that makers um, at the make a movement um, is um, the next generation of innovators. And, and you guys have spoken to that as well. Um, and part of that idea is that the maker movement is also spearheading a new industrial revolution. And this is particularly how Chris Anderson in his book uh, frames the impact of, of maker practice and the, and the global maker culture. So if we take this provocation seriously, that making and maker practice um, is a revolutionary activity, um, what exactly do you think is revolutionary about it? Do you believe that there is a revolution underway? And where are we in the stage of revolutionary change right now? Um, I think, maybe I'll try and answer the, the last one because that's the first one I can remember. So, so where do I think the maker movement is um, in changing everything? Maybe that's the way to put it, which is, I, I do, I, I think there's this great old book called Crossing the Chasm, which described how, you know, small, really cool kids started at one end, and at some point it gets to a place where there's, there's a ticking point where it, it goes from sort of small groups of many people to being a mass thing. And I think the maker movement and a bunch of other things that are like this uh, are on that edge of either falling into the hole and, and or crossing the chasm, and actually it, it can generate a bunch of different things. And I think one of the things that becomes really, and, and mainly, so I, I would say two things. Chris and all those guys, I think, are they're, again, they're saying something from a hopeful, hopeful geographic standpoint from the US, right? It'd be great to have the US have manufacturing, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. It will never be the same manufacturing that it used to be, ever. It just won't be. Culture's moved on. But, but so what becomes interesting then, I think, is 
is two things. I, I would say most of the infrastructure that we have around supply chains globally is sort of old or has been old. And so I, I would look to the, and I'm over 40, so I'm not really allowed to say this, but, but I would say uh, look to the younger generation again because there's this motion that, that, okay, are people in California and in Shanghai and in Taipei more alike than they were 20 years ago, probably, right? And so the idea that, that part of, uh, you know, if you're born with digital, right, that the idea that you want to share, that you are, there's this notion of agency, right, is that the thing that's, that splits between people of either my generation or older, and I feel like I'm in the middle of this, where you're making things and sharing things, and that's part of your idea of wanting to be an agent in the world, that you feel that you can contribute to a bigger something, means that, therefore, if you take the assumption that there are more people that are alike around the world than they are different, and more of those people are connected, then the scale and speed of the change that will happen, it, we're at that moment in time when, when the younger generations, these guys, will begin to own the businesses and infrastructure of the future, not the infrastructures that used to happen. And if that happens, then people are more likely to share and more likely to speed up things that happen. So I'm in this moment where, where I, again, I'm, I'm seeing things in Taipei all across the globe. The thing that I'm really intrigued about is the sort of the Facebook of factories idea. I mean, I've, I've heard Bunny talk about it a bunch. Uh, again, about different places where the sort of younger industry leaders will connect more and more things across the world because they just like sharing stuff and it's a much more, much happier place. And so I think that, that I think for me, is, it sort of gets down to the root sort of of a big question of, of like, is it going to change the world? It, it could, but there are a bunch of things that get in the way. Privacy, the, the stupidity, stupid conversation around IP, which I, I think it's about speed, not about IP. So all of those conversations are around the old establishment of holding on to the way things grew, not the way things can grow in the future. And I think the more the maker movement gets involved in those kinds of conversations, that shares across, I think, is, is, is where we'll jump the chasm and not fall into a big black hole. So that's, that's what I think. The thing is, I think, especially in this forum, the, the, maybe it comes down to everyone's definition of hacker. But for me, I look at my grandparents, well, and I think of what they cook. I think about what they grow in their gardens. I don't think about the technology. So for me, and I get in this forum that the majority of what everyone's involved in, and, and again, the majority of what the media hatches onto, because it's, it's a commercial thing, is what happens to technology when it becomes open source. But the, the question for me is more, I'm much more interested in hacker spaces around, around agriculture, I'm interested in hacker spaces around cooking. Those are things I see that are that much further. They're less technological, but they're, they're still that much more open source. Around. So for me, it's maybe it's down to the definition, but I'm as interested in cooking and growing as I am in soldering. So. Yesterday at um, the panel in the afternoon on the future now and the role of science fiction in, um, in DIY maker communities, um, Paul Dorish put us this provocation that DIY making and the DIY maker movement could actually be a quite conservative endeavor in terms of repeating um, existing systems of power and relationships thinking about um, who actually gets to participate and hang out in a makerspace or in a hackerspace. It's very often people um, who come from a fairly privileged background. And so I'm curious to hear what you have to say about this provocation that perhaps maker practice isn't that revolutionary after all, so the flip side of the, of the conversation we just had, but perhaps a conservative undertaking. For me, again, it, it's about education, right? It's that piece of it, I think. And again, as you can imagine, putting a maker space in the middle of a very rural community in China, the half the time it's just like, either I just want to be able to grow what I want to grow, or I just want to be able to eat something, right? I mean, so those, those, those are really based fundamental questions and the ability to sort of enable people to have access to those opportunities is, is usually through, we didn't even know the questions existed. So again, I'm always in that notion of like, it's like, the, like for me, I'm, I've never a huge fan of the one laptop per child idea, right? Because it's just like, is a laptop. It's just like, I want a bag of seeds. He's a laptop. I want a bag of seeds. And so it's that thing, because you're assuming you know what the answer is. And, and the education world for me is never assuming you know what the answer is and never assuming you know what the questions are. So I, it's that empowering thing, which I do think the maker movement does, which is get people to think about what the right question is. 
and then do I have access to the knowledge and the tools or whatever to go and make that happen? That's why I think it's growing, cooking, technology, whatever it is, communicating, all of those things. Are the same.